So hello. Oh my gosh, what a cavern. Uh, hello and welcome. And uh, I'm going to have a guitar riff stuck in my head for, for the rest of the day. I'm uh, Andrew Weedler. I'm with Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. I'm joined here by Gary Jung, who's the uh, chief of our uh, scientific computing uh, team. Uh, I'm the department chief for user support at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Um, here to talk today a little bit about our work um, as we move towards OpenStack and move towards concepts that we're calling the Science Accelerator Platform. Uh, this is kind of a different talk than some of the other talks here because I'm, I'm really focusing less on, on the technical aspects of, of how OpenStack works and more about what it means as for us as an organization uh, to embrace OpenStack. Um, we're in a very different position than a lot of the other users of OpenStack. Uh, so in some ways, we're approaching this problem from a completely different perspective than a lot of sort of the business case users who are becoming part of the community. Um, I'm also interested in reaching out to, to other folks here. I don't know, I think some folks here, I think I've seen some of your talks, who are also in sort of the national uh, science sort of infrastructure base. Uh, we also wanted to create this talk bank, frankly, to meet you. So uh, I think there's a lot of sort of salient topics to develop upon. At any time, uh, please stop and ask questions. There's, you know, this is, this is actually the right size crowd for this kind of talk. So if, if you want to interrupt or whatever, that's great. Uh, let's make it more of a conversation, because I frankly think everyone over the past three days has probably gotten spoken to or at enough. Um, with that, let me, let me lead on. So uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory is, is uh, uh, in an interesting position for embracing kind of the OpenStack framework. Um, whereas a lot of organizations are kind of coming into OpenStack as a way to increase user freedom, increase the ability for users to self-satisfy uh, their needs with, with storage, with compute, with network features, um, we're already so highly decentralized um, that in some ways OpenStack for us is a challenge because it's really more of a centralization of capabilities uh, than we're used to doing. Uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory is very much uh, part of the UC Berkeley campus, and we operate very much like a research university. Um, so the deployment in our context as we think about not just how we want it, what we want to do with OpenStack, but the features and capabilities that we already have and how we want to roll that into OpenStack, and the whole mission for supporting science um, is a really interesting socio-technical problem. And I want to focus on both sides of that, that, that aspect. Um, so I, I wanted to sort of address this point on sort of four, four key points. One is, what, or sort of three key, key points, what role OpenStack will play in our user support infrastructure. Um, how will end users, uh, uh, who are the users for this? Is it really end users, is it scientists, or is it facilitators, uh, sort of the folks on our side? Um, and then how, how are we looking at building our infrastructure and dependencies um, to manage OpenStack services? Because th there's a heavy lift in becoming part of the OpenStack community successfully. Um, we are in no way resourced in the way CERN or other folks are to create a, a large deployment. Um, so we're going to have to come into this aspect slowly, although we do have a set of very robust capabilities that I'm going to talk about. So first off, what is an LBNL? Um, uh, just so everyone understands, we are not Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Those are our dear friends 40 miles down uh, towards the uh, Central Valley. Uh, we're the small science laboratory uh, above the UC Berkeley uh, campus. Uh, we were founded in 1931. We're actually older than the national lab system. Uh, and uh, most of the heavy elements in the bottom part of the periodic table uh, were discovered at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Uh, so our, our traditional strengths have been in high energy physics, accelerator physics, but now we've branched into uh, virtually all aspects of the, of the sciences. Uh, Biocomputation, genetics, uh, thin film materials, um, you name it, we pretty much are involved in it. And our role is as a science laboratory, so everything we do is unclassified. We do no classified work at all. We, in fact, have a very, very open boundaries, both physically and computationally. We don't run a traditional firewall environment at all. Um, users can bring their own devices. They can do pretty much whatever they want. We do do a fair amount of traffic management and scanning. Uh, but as long as you're not clipping any barriers, you're, you're good to go. And for me, this was a mind blower. Um, I came to LBNL from the Department of Defense about a year ago. And just the idea of being able to carry my cell phone and have it in my pocket was just a, a complete uh, revelation. And in fact, I kept having nightmares that I was going to go to jail because I'd been in meetings with my cell phone. Um, we manage a bunch of key user facilities. So, we, ran it, uh, so we, we do manage the NERSC facility, the National Energy Research, Research Supercomputer. That's one of the top five or 10 uh, computational resources available globally. Um, that is not part of our group. 
Uh, Gary Jung runs the Laurentium cluster, which is a condo unit, about uh, 30,000 cores, uh, sorry, 30,000 CPUs. Um, and we provide a lot of the workhorse computation that exists within the lab. NERSC is operated by BLBL, but it's not an organic part of our IT environment. Uh, we also run the Advanced Light Source, which does a lot of soft X-ray imaging, um, and that's a big global user uh, operative, user uh, uh, facility for scientists around the world. Uh, we run the Molecular Foundry and, uh, and other facilities. So we're really, we're not just physics, we're involved in, in just about everything you can think of. And of course, on the computation side, since all science now is based in IT, that means we're essentially doing every type of computation uh, problem that you can imagine. So who are our users when we try and figure out who they are? Because we're trying to understand, okay, what is the space they inhabit? And I think you probably know a lot of these things. I, I know for you, you guys in the back there particularly, you know, are dealing with the same kind of folks that we are. Um, our users, are, you know, on the National Science Day, they're highly diverse and idiosyncratic. They've got a strong culture of do-it-yourself and infrastructure by the PI, right? Every single science grant is basically its own IT campaign. It's got its own IT problem. Right? And you have to recreate this infrastructure, split it very quickly, and get rid of it very quickly. A very high decentralization of funding, authorities, and mission. Essentially, a PI is, controls their own project, their own resources. Um, projects don't even have to use centralized IT if they don't want to. So that puts us very much in a, a hustle mode. We have to go get their business. We have to earn their trust, and we have to keep it. They don't have to come to us at all. In fact, if they don't want to deal with us, they could go out, buy a, buy a set of racks, put it under their desk, and they're done, right? Um, and that's not ideal for a variety of, variety of reasons. Um, users are primarily living on short money, right? So if you look at proposals, about 80% of proposals fail. So that means our customers are constantly having to apply for money, right? Now if you look at, sort of, you can't read this, of course, because uh, I made it too small, but that was actually on purpose because I can claim any one of those areas or is the point that I want to make. Um, but actually, actually the, the approved is sort of some of that purple and some of the greeny line and some of the gold line there, right? So most, most, most of the time, most of the uh, uh, po uh, pr proposals that are in our system are kind of going through the works or being rejected. In terms of length of grants, People are operating on, on like year cycles. Like a lot of the grants are about 365 days, right? Very few of the grants are longer than that, which means people are, con are they're constantly having to build and recreate projects on a short-term basis, right, and keep themselves funded. And which means they don't have a lot of patience for grand notions of like big infrastructure and how they can contribute to the good of the lab. They're not there for the good of the lab. They're there to run their individual science projects and they have very little time and very little patience and very little money which to do that. And then finally, the grant amounts are relatively small. So three quarters of a million dollars is that first line. So the grants are usually, they're like under a million. They're about a year long. Uh, and most grant proposals fail. Uh, so that means people get real angry real fast if something goes down for a, for a while, right? Or if they can't get what they need very quickly. They have a very strong incentive to do whatever they have to do to build their own IT if they have to to make something happen quickly. So what do we have? What, the response to that, the organiza natural organizational response to that kind of customer is in fact the organizational form that we have now, right? Which is we have all kinds of services, but they're not really connected. They're sort of available. They're kind of Lego bricks that have been scattered all over the floor, right? But we don't have a lot in the way of sort of centralized planning, strategic notion of how we support science, a, a real good feel for how these pieces come together. Uh, largely, they come together through the self-engineering of PIs who happen to have been at the lab long enough to know where they can get storage and where they can get compute and how they can work with Laurentium and where they can get backup, right? Uh, but our, our, our actual ability to kind of reach out and figure out what they're doing and work with them as a partner in kind of their, uh, their, their science endeavor is very limited, um, surprisingly limited. In fact, we don't even have uh, an, a central office that manages work for others. Um, so uh, so there's, there's, a, there's sort of a tenuous relationship between, between sort of what PIs need and what, what we're doing. Um, we really have sort of everything but OpenStack at present. I'm gonna kind of walk through kind of the pieces that we have because we're in this process of moving our way towards the environment that I think you all have embraced, right? And we're in the process of, of trying to embrace. Um, on the networking side, 
we're connected to ESNet. ESNet is actually hosted at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. That provides a, a, a very robust global framework to move large amounts of data around the world. Um, so we're closely affiliated with CERN. We're closely affiliated with pretty much any high energy physics project you can imagine. We're pretty much closely affiliated with sort of any large uh, geospatial telemetry type science project um, that there is. Um, at our perimeter, we run basically a completely op pretty open environment. We really don't running a firewall environment. Um, internally, we have very robust ethernet, very high speed, and that's available to everyone. Um, we have you know, storage elements, um, and then we have the Laurentium condo cluster, uh, and that provides um, about 800 teraflops peak performance um, resources that are condo owned by virtually every science entity at the laboratory, uh, where essentially anyone can come and share, share cycles. Uh, and that's actually very well provisioned with an infrastructure to sort of quickly get people on uh, and get them, get them working. But it's not connected to an OpenStack uh, type environment yet. And then, of course, we have this big shotgun blast, which is, if you've driven around, you know, you've seen these signs like that. And that's essentially how we provide our services, kind of <laughs> right, okay. Um, what we have is we have, you know, we have Software Farm, which provides a development environment onto Laurentium. So it provides a very easy way for people to take their VMs, uh, register them with the Software Farm service, automatically receive a propagated environment that's ready for them to, to push jobs onto Laurentium. Uh, we, we develop Singularity, uh, which is a Docker-like uh, but very lightweight um, uh, packaging uh, capability, for, specifically de designed for HPC. Um, we're standing up a very robust science VM capability, and that's going to be used for both VDI and for compute provision and for, for prototyping. Um, uh, much of that is going to be extremely low cost, um, since you know, some of that's the, art, uh, the weight and the nature of accounting at a national lab where who knows what really gets charged to where. But, but in fact, uh, we can offer the, that capability um, at a substantial discount to other options. Um, Globus and Druva, very highly involved with that. Um, we've been, we've been uh, uh, in fact, at Druva we stood up this year and we've, um, uh, we have a, several hundred terabytes uh, already sort of ingested in, uh, into that, just backing up people's endpoints. Um, Globus, we've now connected to Google Drive, and we're in the process of rolling that out, and that provides sort of an unlimited sized endpoint for, for, for movement of data around the world. Um, software carpentry, data carpentry, training, we do all kinds of things. We provide training for Arduinos, we provide training for building endpoints, deploying stuff into the field. I'm very interested in our side in, in, in how we grow capabilities in machine learning, uh, and also how we look at telemetry um, uh, enhancements. Um, we have very permissive cyber and network management. We have access to the commercial cloud, and we're busy putting master pair arrangements in place. Um, up till now, we, we really don't have that. So people can go out with their own credit card, get on Amazon. They can take lab data. They can put it out onto Azure or wherever. And we have absolutely no ability to, to really know what they're doing, um, which is odd. Um, wide open software availability. Um, we provide uh, Jupyter Hub, and been we've been heavily involved in that project since, since the start. Um, and then, you know, we've, we've gone full into the G Suite environment, uh, both G Suite and now increasingly we're going to be looking at G Compute. So the, the point of all this is we've got a ton of stuff, but none of it's knit together, right? It's not a platform. It's not a common environment for so science capability provisioning. So we've created this, this huge, very flexible framework, right? But flexibility has its costs. And I think that's what we're starting to realize. And this is the, sort of the, one of the drivers for why we want to engage in greater collaboration with, with folks like you who are, who are developing capabilities that, that I think we're very interested in and that we want to contribute to. Um, we have tons and tons of short-term projects. Right? They're all doing their own thing. We are, we are basically not involved with them. The larger projects optimize for their own needs, and they actually deploy their own shadow IT. In fact, we have different facilities that, in fact, have compute racks that we don't touch. We don't have anything to do with them. Right? We have no idea what the total compute capability at the National Lab currently is. Um, and what that means is you have shadow IT and really also postdocs filling uh, many gaps. And that's actually sort of terrible, right? Um, so to give you an idea of kind of the mess it is, what I did is I took all of the proposals that we got this past year, and I just sort of word clouded that. You know, word clouds sort of suck, I mean, no matter what you do, right? But what's cool about this is, like, it's just a mess, right? We're into everything. We're touching everything. There's no order or structure to that cloud particularly.
Uh, and what this also means is that when you ask the postdocs, right, who are the least empowered segment of our community, what they spend their time on, right? They're losing a lot of their time, which is crazy at the lab level, right? This shadow IT has taken up 20, 30, you know, 10 to 20, 30, 10 to 20% of their time, okay? That has a real cost that we're not measuring. It has a real cost in careers that are disrupted, in proposals that aren't written, in people who become disaffected with the scientific enterprise because they're not doing science. They're doing IT, right? That's our job. We should be doing that. They should do the science, right? But we don't account for any of that cost. And so what we're trying to do is think about, okay, how can we, how can we build sets of services and capabilities to improve upon that? So here's, I wanted to go through quickly sort of sets of examples for the kinds of science activities that are going on, get, just to get a feel for like sort of how decentralized some of these things are. So uh, one project we're working on is called uh, uh, the Airborne Radiological Enhanced Sensor Data Pipeline, it's called ARIES. Um, this is work where we actually have been doing a lot of geospatial sampling, uh, flying a helicopter uh, with sodium iodine logs um, all, over, uh, all over the US, all over the Southwest, and doing de very detailed collections of radiological background environments, and then doing free mapping from that. Um, what's interesting from a science standpoint is what you're trying to do is increase your ability to detect radiological objects at a distance by having a better prior model for what the background radiation environment looks like. Uh, in the case of this, this particular activity, the IT com component of this is really on the data collection and compute side. So uh, essentially, we're supporting the transfer of data from LS Air Force Base to, uh, to LBNL via Globus. Um, we're doing the compute in our condo cluster, but not as part of our Laurentium cluster. It's in a separate rack of equipment that's not a part of our, our management environment. So we're not sharing any of those resources, so the utilization rate on that can be relatively low. Uh, and then we're also piping the data to vendor equipment uh, where they're doing al tests of algorithm, right? So there's sort of one model for how we're supporting an effort. Another model uh, on the uh, biocomputational side is uh, LEGO, uh, and particularly the Noctua system. And these are sets of databases um, that basically it's a sort of a system en engineering tool. It's an analytic tool where people can, can express what a gene is, they can express the genetic expressions of that, how these things combine, and develop the mappings for that. Um, and this is a set of databases that, that, that the scientists themselves spill up 40, 40 or 50 of these databases all the time on AWS and supply it to customers around the world. They're gathering the data back into object models that are, that are contained centrally back at LBL, but they have nothing to do with IT. We have no involvement with this at all, right? So they're running all of the relationships themselves. They're managing the AWS contract. Um, they're, they're, they're duplicating resources we've already got. They're spooling up stuff up and down. And the only involvement we have is essentially making sure that they're not blocked um, by, any of our, by any of our internal systems. And then finally, a, a, a third example looking at geocarbon uh, sequestration. This is a heavy compute project. This is something we are doing in our Laurentium cluster. So they're in our condo and they're in our management layer, which is nice, right? And they're doing sort of large finite element computation of uh, geo uh, uh, subterranean features. So you're looking at um, uh, processing signals collected from wells as you're, as you're doing test injections of CO2. You're looking at your ability to model the flow of that material in subterranean structures. Uh, and how that interacts. And you're using legacy codes that, that, that LBNL has worked on for probably 25 years, right? So completely different side of activity, completely different management of how this project works, completely different use of the different resources among all three projects. So then what's, what's the niche for OpenStack? We see that there's a key niche, right? And that's why coming, uh, coming and interacting with these con this conference and other things that we're, we're trying to do are, are important. Um, we've already developed a set of organic capabilities um, our user base runs the gamut in terms of what they need, the desire for services, um, uh, but we're coming at this problem sort of completely from the reverse direction, where we're so decentralized that putting an open stack is in fact centralizing things, right? It's, it's changing the service model from, oh, I know Bill, let me have him set up the VPN for us, right? To, um, uh, to you know, using a user base system to support that, which is different than some of the, like, the commercial models or like what, what uh, Verizon or other folks are using this system for. So what's, what's the model here for OpenStack? Um, are our customers the scientists or the PI? Are they the folks who are gonna be using this? 
Um, well, we're not, we're not sure. It may in fact be that this, is, this just becomes a fabric as part of our internal management capabilities. And it's not clear to us that this becomes part of our high performance computation or our scientific computing. This may be part of a mid-tier activity that we're engaged in to unify some of our, our capabilities together. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about sort of the thinking there in, in just a bit. Um, uh, this problem though, particularly, is, is sort of endemic to all of scientific support. Right? And I think you guys are probably, uh, everyone's experiencing it as you look at the, the commercial cloud and how services are managed there. Uh, so when, when, you, when, you, when you have researchers who are going out to like AWS or to Azure, um, you know, there's a substantial training burden that's put upon your IT infrastructure, even though you're not providing those services. Because if you throw someone out to AWS, right, what do they see? They see a, they see a page like on, on the right there, right, with like 50 different services. Should they use EC2? What kind of storage should they use? How do they manage it? Is it on the spot market? How do they control their costs? Right? None of those issues are really worked out. Right? And most scientists are, in fact, not data scientists. They don't come in organically knowing how to set up a, a computational you know, an ingest pipeline, a compute cluster, storage, right? output, whatever it is they need organically, unless they have postdocs. Right? But that's, that's not what we want to have happen in the first place. Right? So there's a substantial burden in, in, in just throwing people out into the, into the commercial cloud that also exists on the OpenStack side, if we just present that open, pr provide that as an open environment for research. Um, uh, so both sort of internally and externally with these, these commercial things, we have sort of these hodgepodges of there's all these things you can, you can do, right? But how do you actually tailor it for the scientific environment in which these folks find themselves, which is short money, short time frame, high stress, right? And a specific, and a specific uh, 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 orchestration path. What that means for us is if, if we just build OpenStack, right, and without thinking about how it becomes, how it be used as a, scient as a platform for scientific use, we'll build it and they won't come. Uh, so I think we'll have more success actually building the interface first. What we're, what we're doing is walking our way towards the on-prem cloud, right, by taking all the features we currently have developing those into a framework which is more tightly coupled to the scientific workflow and the scientific conduct of business, right? And then, over time, that will become enabled by OpenStack. And here's where, where we are. We're stealing from, from a variety of folks in the OpenStack community. Um, I think Australia's Nectar uh, uh, capability is, is, is sort of a fabulous model for us to learn from. And I appreciate you guys coming. I see you right over there. Right? Um, you've been very generous with, your, with, with providing us access uh, and, uh, and an AAF account. Really appreciate that. Um, uh, but there's, you know, there's other models with CERN. There's other models with um, UCSD and the National Data Service that we're trying to connect up with. Uh, PNNL, our sister laboratory, um, has an OpenStack environment they call PIC, which they use to provision compute resources to their researchers. So we're, trying, we're, we're engaged in a process of trying to learn from all these cases and say, OK, it's not just enough to provide network features, storage features, compute features, other things, and just throw it out there, right? We're a science laboratory. How do I tailor these things specifically for the mission we have? Uh, and that's the challenge. Um, we're also, you know, Compute Canada is also a very interesting example. Um, uh, they're uh, engaged in, in, a, in, a, in a really interesting uh, examination of how they provide resources to their community. Um, but they have an advantage over us in terms of they're highly centralized. So Compute Canada, when they set up a condo, Compute Canada owns all of the compute resources that go in there. And they provision that all as a, as a, as a, um, as a grant to their researchers. In our case, the PIs own all the compute resources that individually go into a condo. Completely different rationale for how you get people to share resources, how you build a common framework for it, and how, you, how much you can actually get them to work into a common environment, right? All right, so what is the sign of our workflow? And I do apologize. This is far more visible on my screen than it is on yours. But um, sort of at the, at the top of things, you have you know, a scientist trying to identify grant opportunities. They're trying to register and apply for grants. They're trying to obtain funding and establish a research project. They're trying to manage and perform research. They're trying to analyze and adjust their research. And there may be a feedback loop as they change their data pipeline, their, their analytic pipeline. And certainly there's a process with R and other tools as they think about like, how they're analyzing the data and what they're getting from, from whatever experiment, experiment it is that they're conducting. And there's a project closeout. And underpinning all of those are sets of tasks with publishing, 
They've got to outreach, teach, and mentor, even though they don't really necessarily want to do that. Uh, and they have to maintain disciplinary situational awareness. You know, they have to keep current in what's happening in their field, because you can't apply for grants if someone else has already sort of gone down, gone down a well-trodden path. So what we're trying to do is identify in those spaces what are the functions that have to be performed by our research, and then how would we take those functions and describe the sets of tools and capabilities that would fit into that, right? To change, ultimately, what the front end of our cloud implementation will look like. So first, let's take the tools and capabilities we have and mold them into this framework, and then second, deploy a cloud framework. So initially, like, if someone wants to find grants, you know, they're going to have to you know, log into some sort of grant watcher dashboard. This is sets of tools, and maybe initially iframing, sets of capabilities we've already got. Um, but right now, these tools are disparate and scattered all over the environment. Uh, they may have to be you know, man managing like, external grant sites. And we're looking a lot at the Open Science Foundation, uh, and they have a set of, uh, the Open Science Foundation has a set of tools that they're using to like, register science projects and register where data is stored in those projects, where data is published, where it's provisioned, how it's transported, and who, who are the collaborators on a specific set of projects, make that globally searchable. I think that's very interesting, that's a model we may, we may promote. And then of course there's tons of library resources. On the applying for, you know, the next stage sort of applying for grants, there's gonna be a whole set of capabilities to leverage our existing tools um, to manage grant proposals and grant writing, including uh, looking at like, how do we automate the research data management plan generation process? How can we make that easy for folks? And then how can we tie that into the orchestration expressions that would exist in a cloud. In terms of running a project, um, a big problem we have is we have a lot of scientists who come in using user facilities. They're coming on site for about six or eight weeks, maybe longer. They're running maybe a beam line at the advanced light source, which means they, they run all the instrumentation on the beam line, they collect all the data on the beam line, they build their own research, IT research on that beam line. And they have to understand quickly all of the safety and other regulatory and financial and other uh, uh, physical connectivity that they have to understand in order to maintain and build that beam line. So one thing we're looking at a lot is like um, uh, recommendation features, knowledge bases, chatbots, other capabilities to synthesize data from multiple sets of guidance and provide people with the information that they need. Um, and then there's just sets of standard collaboration tools um, that, that we would, we'd, we'd provide. Okay, and then finally you get to the actual science part, right? Which is, okay, now that I've got an ingest pipeline working, now that I'm collecting data, now that I'm beginning to compute, how do I get people into Laurentium quickly? How do I get people into the science VM space quickly, right? How do I provision that in a way that's salient to the needs that they have for that, that phase of the project? And that's where we're looking at like, okay, how do we provide these sets of tools and capabilities onto standard sets of task-focused dashboards? They'll provide them more of a platform. And then finally, you get the sort of the broader functions that people have. So science communications, library research, publishing, putting up websites. We run all of these capabilities now, but they're not fit into any kind of framework that someone can quickly find. So in our case, what is gonna drive OpenStack at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory is actually not direct user demand. So the scientists are not interested in making the infrastructure of the laboratory better, better, uh, you know, better more robust capability. Um, on our side, we are interested in helping them do science more effectively. So it's gonna be a process of experimentation where we're providing things as people come in, in many cases for free, and seeing how they respond to it and seeing if they actually can, 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 you know, can demonstrate productivity gains on that. Um, it's not clear that OpenStack by itself, if you just throw it out there, actually makes their job any easier, right? Because right now, if they need a separate network feature or a port opened, or they need to register server logs with us, we do that now with a hand touch very quickly. Um, it's not clear that an interface is really gonna streamline that. But there are still very good reasons why, why an organization like ours wants to get into the OpenStack space. First is collaboration with, with other sites and other capabilities around the country that are doing this. The second is we want to broker the relationship between the private cloud and our on-prem compute resources more effectively. We don't want data going out, even if it's not data we own, right? 
without having a good sense for where it's going, has it been backed up, is it being managed effect effectively, are we clipping any PI restrictions or anything, uh, and anything else like that. And then we want to provide better data and feder federated data and query services. So right now we don't do a great job supporting meta analytics because we don't have a central querial capability. So for example, there's, there's 40 years of beamline collections on the advanced light source. That's all data that globally people could do a lot of good with if it was queryable and if it was available. But guess what? It's not in a common place because we don't own the data. People come in, they run their own beamline with their own funds, they collect their data and they take that data and they go off. We don't have a mechanism in place to even gather that stuff in. So all of those features actually drive the organization towards things like OpenStack and we look forward to becoming part of the community over this next year as we stand up capability. But there's gonna be a lot of experimentation on our side to figure out, okay, how do we actually make sure we're providing the right set of capabilities to the right audience? Which in many cases is not the scientists directly, it's us doing things behind the scenes to try and make, make the science environment more effective. So, that's the conclusion. Um, in our case, OpenStack is not about cost. Uh, it's not about efficiency from the standpoint of measure, some of the measurable metrics that we have. It is about efficiency from the standpoint of thinking about like how do we do reduce the burden on our poor postdocs and other folks like that. We want to make sure stay in their discipline and produce great science. And we may not go it alone. We are, you know, we're look very interested in like looking at partnerships and looking at like, okay, do we use this as a natural mechanism to, to buy into someone else's open stack or sets of capabilities as maybe a multi-lab activity. But I think uptake is gonna be, is gonna be extremely organic. Um, we're not just gonna go out deploy a, a, a large instance so that we have the capability to do that, um, and then roll it out to our science base. Because frankly, people would probably poke it with a stick and keep doing what they're doing on their own, given the financial structures that they have. Um, so it's gonna be a process of proselytizing and figuring out how we get into their workflow to make that happen. And with that, I'm done. Thank you all very much.